Welcome to lecture 15 of computer aided engineering design. Here we will discuss how to design Bezier segments and curves. In the layout, we are down the ladder. We are just done discussing how to design Ferguson segments and composite Ferguson curves. Now, we are discussing Bezier segments and curves. Why is there a need for other curve design models? In previous lectures, we had discussed how to design Ferguson segments and curves. It was not very intuitive to specify the slope information or tangent information. This is especially when our designer wants to design a three dimensional composite curve. Our designer is more comfortable in specifying the data points as opposed to higher order information like slope or curvature. We are looking for alternative curve design methods that allow to specify only design points or data points while maintaining local shape control. Let us look first at the graphic construction of a parabola. All of you must have done this in your first year engineering drawing course. Given two line segments, how to construct a parabola using them. The key idea is this, you divide the two line segments such that the ratio of this length over this length is the same as the ratio of this length over this length. And then join these two points. You repeat the procedure again here. This length over this length is the same as this length over this length. Once again, this length over this length is the same as this length over this length. You would keep continuing the process and finally, you would want to draw a curve that passes through this point to this point and it is tangent to all these line segments. The curve in red is your parabola. The construction in the previous slide alludes to the three tangent theorem to construct a parabola. We have two segments. We discretize them such that the length of this segment over the length of this segment is the same as the length of this segment over the length of this segment. We join these two points and we mark another point on the segment maintaining the length ratio. We have seen before that the curve joining this point, this point and this point is a parabola. To add further, this curve is also such that these three line segments are tangent Let us nomenclate different points now. Point A, point B, C, D, E, and F. For F to lie on a parabola and line segments A, B, and B, C, and D, E to be tangents to the curve, as per the theorem, these length ratios that is A D over D B 
should be equal to B E over E C and that should be equal to D F over F E. We have seen this relation before. Any point on a line segment can be expressed as D equals 1 minus u times a plus u times b, where u is a parameter that assumes the value between 0 and 1. a and b are the position vectors and d is the position vector of a point on the line a b. For u equals 0, d would merge with a and for u equals 1, d would coincide with b. Likewise, point E on the segment B C is given as 1 minus u times b plus u times c. Notice how the length ratios are being maintained. the value for parameter u would be identical in these two relations. And finally, f as 1 minus u times d plus u times e. Again, the length ratios are maintained. If we substitute for d from here and for e from here, we will get f equals 1 minus u squared times a plus 2u times 1 minus u times b plus u squared times c. Once again, a, b and c are position vectors of these three points. It would not be very difficult for us to figure using coordinate geometry that f would lie on a parabola. This may be one way to verify how point f would lie on a parabola. The generic equation of a conic is given by a x squared plus 2 h x y plus b y squared plus 2 f x plus 2 g y plus c equals 0. Here a h b f g and c are unknown constants. We have seen from the construction before that the parametric equation of a parabola is given by f equals 1 minus u squared times a plus 2u times 1 minus u times b plus u squared times c. One can extract the x component of f and the y component of f and substitute those conditions over here to determine these unknown constants. And then one could verify for a parabola that x square equals a b. Let this be an exercise for you. The de Castle-Jews approach generalizes the construction. One may not constrain himself or herself to only two segments to start with. One would notice that a parabola is a result of two linear interpolations. A generalization that de Castle-Jew worked on was based on repeated linear interpolation. Let us see this graphically. Assume that we have this control polyline as we call it, a set of line segments adjacent to each other. Let us nomenclate the points. This point here is B sub 0 
super 0, I will explain what the subscripts and superscripts mean in a while. This point B sub 1 super 0, B sub 2 0, B sub 3 0 and B sub 4 0 for this example. The subscript here represents the index of these endpoints and the superscript represents the stage of linear interpolation. At this time, we have not performed any linear interpolation as such. And therefore, these numbers, the superscripts are 0. Let us now start performing the first stage linear interpolation. For a given value of parameter u, this length ratio is specified. I can mark this point as B 0 1. This one now represents the first stage linear interpolation. This is the first point that I have marked 0. Take 2. I maintain the length ratios and keep marking the points. This point here is B sub 1 super 1. This point here is B sub 2 super 1 and this is B sub 3 super 1. I join these points to these line segments and I do not stop. I keep performing linear interpolation. This point here on this line segment represents the first point of stage 2 linear interpolation. That is why it is nomenclated as B sub 0 2. Notice that I am maintaining the length ratio throughout my linear interpolation. The point on the second segment is B 1 2. The point here is B 2 2. We join these three points and continue with linear interpolation. This point here is B sub 0 3, representing the first point of stage 3 linear interpolation. This point here is B sub 1 3. And finally, we join these two points. We mark a point here on this line segment and we nomenclate this point as the first point of the fourth stage linear interpolation. You would realize that we can go no further with linear interpolation anymore. This curve here would be very similar to a parabola that we have seen before. And this curve will pass through the first point, the last point, and the final point as a result of repeated linear interpolation. Also, the first line segment, the last line segment, and this line segment over here, they all will be tangent. very similar to what we have seen in case of parabola. Now, let us try to work backwards. We start from B 0 4. It is the result of linear interpolation between B 0 3 and B 1 3. For a given parameter u, it is 1 minus u times B 0 3 plus u times B 1 3. B 0 3 itself is a result of linear interpolation between B 0 2 and B 1 2. We know what the relation is. We directly substitute the result for B 0 3 and likewise for B 1 3 as well, realizing 
that B13 right here is a result of linear interpolation between B12 and B22. You would get the final expression as 1 minus u times 1 minus u B02 plus u times B12 plus u times 1 minus u times B12 plus u times B22. All you will need to do is keep on substituting for these points here, which we call the intermediate decastergy point. If you keep on working, the final result will look like this. The left hand side, which represents a point on the curve for a given value of u is b 0 4 equals 1 minus u raised to 4 times b sub 0 super 0 plus 4 times u times 1 minus u q times b 1 0 plus 6 u square times 1 minus u square b 2 0 plus 4 u q times 1 minus u times b 3 0 plus u raised to 4 times b 4 0. Notice that this expression here is of degree 4 in u. This superscript therefore represents the degree of the curve. Also note that B00, B10, B20, B30 and B40 are design points that are specified may be interactively by the designer. Bezier's approach was not geometric, it was algebraic. In general, a point on an nth degree curve can be written as summation i going from 0 to n, n combination i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u raised to i times b i. b i are the design points specified by the designer. This is equal to summation i going from 0 to n, b sub i super n as a function of u times b i. If we relate b i to the nomenclature that we have seen before, b i would be the first stage design points b i 0 and capital B sub i super n would be functions of u that will be equal to n combination i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u i. This is the term right here. Capital B sub i super n are called Bernstein polynomials. As I said before, the Castor-Jeeves approach was geometric, while Bezier's approach was algebraic and it followed the de Castor-Jeeves approach. It is interesting to note that both the approaches gave the same result. If you look at this expression, B sub 0 super n equals i going from 1 to n when in summation, capital B i super n a function of u times b i the design points. This expression represents a Bezier curve a degree n and in fact both the Bezier's approach and the de Castle approach give 
the same Bezier segment. Coming back to de Castle juice approach, there is a very nice triangular scheme to compute the intermediate de Castle juice points. Let us see how. The first thing you need to do is arrange all the design points in the first column. B 0 0, B 1 0, B 2 0, you keep on going B n minus 2 0, B sub n minus 1 super 0 and B n 0. In the second column, we start placing the first stage interpolation points. We use this point here B 0 0 and B 1 0, combine them to get B 0 1. Likewise, we use B sub 1 super 0 and B sub 2 super 0, combine them together and get the first stage linear interpolation between them. This linear interpolation is being performed for a known value of u. We keep on going, we combine edges and design points to get a new point. In this case, B n minus 2 1 and finally, we combine the last two design points to get B sub n minus 1 super 1. The third column would have all intermediate de Castle points as a result of the linear interpolation between points in the first column. For example, we combine B 0 1 and B 1 1 to get, you guessed it right, B 0 2. Likewise, we combine B n minus 2 super 1 and B n minus 1 super 1 to get, once again you are right, B n minus 2 super 2. We keep on following the scheme until we see the last two points in the last but one stage of linear interpolation as B 0 super n minus 1 and B 1 super n minus 1. And finally, we combine these two to get R B sub 0 super n. Notice once again that this point will lie on an nth degree curve in the parameter u. The arrows pointing downwards represent multiplication with factor 1 minus u and those pointing upwards represent multiplication by u. There is a point I want to mention here. This column, the very first column contains the position vectors of all the design points. By that I mean that in this entire triangular scheme, we are working individually with the x coordinates, with the y coordinates and with the z coordinates. These points here on the second column, on the third column and so on and so forth would be again the position vectors of all the intermediate de Castle points. One would keep that in mind. Let us now discuss some properties of Bernstein polynomials. First one, non negativity. For parameter values between 0 and 1, all Bernstein polynomials, capital B sub i super n, are non negative. Well, 
we know that Bunstein polynomials are given by n combination i times u raised to i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i. We can expand n combination i in terms of n factorial over i factorial times n minus i factorial. Notice that for u to lie between 0 and 1, this is positive and this is positive. So, there is no way in which these Bunstein polynomials will be negative. Let us look at a few examples. These are the Bernstein polynomials for a degree 3 Bezier curve. This is B sub 0 super 3. This one is B sub 1 super 3. This one is B sub 2 super 3. And this is B sub 3 super 3. You would notice that they are all non negative. Another example of degree 4 Bunstein polynomial. This one is B sub 0 super 4. This one here is B sub 1 super 4. This is B sub 2 super 4. This one is B sub 3 super 4. And finally, this one is B sub 4 super 4. Once again, all of them non negative. The second property of Bernstein polynomials, this one relates to the partition of unity. All Bernstein polynomials will sum to 1. This is interesting. You start with 1 and you add to it minus u and plus u. The result is expected 1. What you do now is raise it by an exponent n. As you would know again the left hand side will be 1, but the right hand side can be expressed as a binomial expansion of 1 minus u plus u raised to n. This is how it looks n combination 0 times 1 minus u raised to n times u raised to 0 plus n combination 1 times 1 minus u raised to n minus 1 times u plus n combination 2 1 minus u raised to n minus 2 times u squared and many terms. This would be the last term here n combination n times 1 minus u raised to 0 times u raised to n. If you notice the right hand side will have terms that would individually correspond to Bernstein polynomial. For example, this term here would represent the first Bernstein polynomial of degree n. This term here would be the second Bernstein polynomial again of degree n. And the last one here will be capital B sub n super n. While the left hand side would still be 1. We have exactly shown this relation here. Once again, all Bernstein polynomials of the same degree would add to 1, and this is partition of unity property. Next, Bernstein polynomials as barycentric coordinates. I will tell you what barycentric means in a while. Non negativity and partition of unity properties make Bernstein polynomials barry centric coordinates. 
the term barycenter refers to the center of gravity. Let us say we have a set of points x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4, x 5, x 6 and x 7. If there are masses associated with these points, for example, m 1, m 2, m 3, m 4, m 5, m 6 and m 7, it is possible for us to compute the center of mass of these points. That would be somewhere shown by the red dot over here, x c m, the coordinate of the center of mass. We also know by a geometry that this center of mass would lie within the convex hull defined by these points. So, the red dot will never be outside this convex polygon here. To re emphasize, x c m will always lie within the convex hull of data points. This expression is very familiar. The coordinates of the center of mass would be given by m 1 x 1 plus m 2 x 2 plus m 7 x 7 over the sum of all the 7 masses for this example. Here x would either be the x coordinate or the y coordinate. If we replace all these masses by Bernstein polynomials, we have x as a function of u now because all these Bernstein polynomials are functions of u respectively. If we replace m 1 by say v sub 0 n, m 2 by say v sub 1 n and so on so forth we get x u as b sub 0 n times x 0 plus v sub 1 n times x 1 and so on so forth up till v sub n super n times x n over the sum of all Bernstein polynomials. We have seen using the partition of unity property that all these Bernstein polynomials will sum to 1 and therefore, this expression here will represent a point on the bezier curve. What am I trying to say here? Well, for a given value of u between 0 and 1, x of u will always be seen to be within the convex hull of data points, no matter what u is. In other words, a Bezier curve will always lie within the convex hull of data points and that is something that we will see later. This is just for you to keep in mind as of now. The third property of Bernstein polynomials, symmetry. Capital B sub i super n is the same as capital B sub n minus i super n as a function of 1 minus u. We start with the left hand side, B sub i super n is given by n combination i 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u raised to i and we expand n combination i over here. This expression is equal to factorial n over factorial p times factorial n minus p times t raised to p times 1 minus t raised to n minus p. If we replace 1 minus u with t and n minus i with p. Here, 
this expression for the becomes n combination p times 1 minus t raised to n minus p times t raised to p, which is in fact the peak Bernstein polynomial or degree n. And if we replace p here and t here, we get b sub n minus i 2 per n 1 minus t, which is the right hand side here. The fourth property recursion b sub i super n as a function of u is equal to 1 minus u times b sub i super n minus 1 a function of u plus u times b sub i minus 1 super n minus 1 u. What do I mean here? The ith Bernstein polynomial of degree n can be expressed as a linear combination of the ith Bernstein polynomial of degree n minus 1 and i minus 1 Bernstein polynomial again of degree n minus 1 with the weight factors 1 minus u and u here. To prove this, let us start with the right hand side 1 minus u times b i super n minus 1 plus u times b i minus 1 super n minus 1. Let us expand these Bernstein polynomials to get n minus 1 factorial over factorial i factorial n minus i minus 1 times 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u i plus n minus 1 factorial over i minus 1 factorial times n minus i factorial times 1 minus u raised to n minus i u i. Notice that these two terms are absorbed in this expression. If we work further with the right hand side, what we can do is we can take this factor out common, which is n minus 1 factorial over i minus 1 factorial, n minus 1 minus i factorial, 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u i. And what will be left with will be 1 over i plus 1 over n minus i. A little bit of algebra, this term here will be n over i over n minus i. This n minus i term gets absorbed over here to get n minus i factorial. This i gets absorbed over here to get i factorial and n times n minus 1 factorial is n factorial. And we have this term right here, 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u i. And this is the ith Bernstein polynomial of degree n, which is the left hand side. Let us look at some derivatives of Bernstein polynomials. We will be needing these derivatives later to design composite Visa curves to impose slope and curvature, continuity conditions at junction points between individual Visa segments. We already know how Bernstein polynomials are expressed as functions of u. The first derivative of an nth degree Bernstein polynomial is given by b sub i minus 1 super n minus 1 minus b sub i super n minus 1. Here we follow a convention b sub n minus 1 sub minus 1 is equal to 0 and b sub n minus 1 sub n is equal to 0. Notice that I am using a slightly different convention for Bernstein polynomials over here. The first term here represents the degree, which is the same 
if I represent the degree by the superscript here. Many books tend to follow this notation. We know what a Bernstein polynomial is of degree n, it is n factorial over factorial i factorial n minus i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i times u raised to i. Differentiate this with respect to u to give factorial n over factorial i factorial n minus i. This is n minus i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i minus 1 and there would be a negative sign over here if we differentiate this term here with respect to u plus i times 1 minus u raised to n minus i u raised to i minus 1. We absorb this term inside to get factorial n over factorial i times n minus 1 minus i factorial times 1 minus u raised to n minus i minus 1 u raised to i plus factorial n over factorial i minus 1 times factorial n minus i multiplied by 1 minus u u raised to i minus 1. A little bit of work will lead us to common factor n that multiplies n minus 1 combination i minus 1 times 1 minus u times u raised to i minus 1 minus n minus 1 combination i 1 minus u raised to n minus i minus 1 times u raised to i and this is the i minus 1 Bernstein polynomial of degree n minus 1 minus the ith Bernstein polynomial of degree n minus 1, which is the same expression over here. Likewise, the second, the third and the fourth derivative can also be computed. Now, let us discuss barycentric coordinates and a fine transformation. Bernstein polynomials allow description of a curve to be space independent of the coordinate frame and we will see how this happens using a simple two dimensional example. First, what is an affine map? An affine map is of the type y equals a x plus t x would be the Cartesian vector of a point, a is the transformation matrix and t is the translation vector, y is the Cartesian vector of the result. We have seen before that if we use homogeneous coordinates for x and y, this translation vector gets absorbed in the 4 by 4 transformation matrix. Anyhow, let us first investigate how axis rotation will affect the relation. We have a two dimensional Cartesian space, we have a point A, another point B and a point C which is represented as a weighted linear combination of points A and B, here the weights are scalars lambda and mu. If we rotate the axis to x prime y prime maintaining the position of the origin and if the rotation angle is theta what happens? Well, A prime 
this point here will now be expressed in terms of new coordinates x 1 prime and y 1 prime as a two dimensional rotation matrix with terms cosine of theta, sine of theta, minus sine of theta, cosine of theta times the original position of A given by coordinates x 1 and y 1. Likewise, the new coordinates of B will be given by x 2 prime y 2 prime, which is equal to the same rotation matrix here pre multiplying the original coordinates of B given by x 2 and y 2. If we maintain this linear combination, C prime star will have the x coordinate as lambda times x 1 prime plus mu times x 2 prime and the y coordinate will be lambda times y 1 prime plus mu times y 2 prime. In matrix form, this will be lambda times the column vector x 1 prime y 1 prime plus mu times the column vector x 2 prime y 2 prime. Try to relate this expression with this expression here. If I substitute for x 1 prime, x 2 prime, y 1 prime and y 2 prime, the right hand side would become lambda times this rotation matrix times the original coordinates of A plus mu times the rotation matrix times the original coordinates of B. I can take the rotation matrix common and I will have lambda times x 1 y 1 plus mu times x 2 y 2, which is nothing but C. So, we observe that the coordinates of C 1 prime star is the same as the coordinates in other words, the rotation of the axis does not affect the linear combination. Now, let us study the effect of axis translation by a vector p q. We have the original axis point A, point B and point C. Let us translate this axis by vector p q. The new coordinates of A with respect to this translated axis will be given by A prime, which is x 1 prime y 1 prime, which is equal to x 1 minus p y 1 minus q. The x coordinate of B prime will be given by x 2 minus p and the y coordinate of b prime will be given by y 2 minus q. If we maintain the same linear combination, we will have c prime star equal lambda times a prime plus mu times b prime, while c prime will be given by lambda times x 1 plus mu times x 2 minus of p. This is the x coordinate and the y coordinate will be lambda times y 1 plus mu times y 2 minus q. How did I get this expression? Well, note that c was expressed initially as a linear combination between a and b. And this translation of axes would directly affect that relation. Let us further see if 
p prime star is the same as p prime. We start with p prime star, we substitute the coordinates of x 1 prime y 1 prime and x 2 prime y 2 prime from here. We get c prime star equals lambda times x 1 minus p y 1 minus q plus mu times x 2 minus p y 2 minus q. The x coordinate of c prime star is lambda times x 1 plus mu times x 2 minus of lambda plus mu times p and the y coordinate is lambda times y 1 plus mu times y 2 minus lambda plus mu times q. What I have done here is I have added and subtracted p from the x coordinate and likewise I have added and subtracted q from the y coordinate. In fact, these two expressions are respectively the same as these two expressions. Now, if C was to be expressed in the new that is translated coordinate system, we should have expected the coordinates of C prime to be identical to those of T prime star. This would mean that this expression should be the same as this expression and the y coordinate of c prime should be the same as the y coordinate of c prime star. And this can happen only when the two scalars sum to 1. Notice that we never mentioned that lambda and mu cannot be negative or 0 for that matter. All we see here is the two scalars, they should sum to 1. A fine combination is a type of linear combination, where the respective weights sum to unity. As I mentioned before, these weights need not be all positive. An affine transformation is a function that maps straight lines to straight lines. It preserves parallel lines and overall preserves all affine combinations, just as a linear transformation would preserve all linear combinations.